All right. Doors are open, which is good. We'll let some folks in, which is great. Actually, I should probably do this. Uh, okay, good. There we go. We've got the doors open for our class. We won't be starting for another couple of minutes, but uh, we see we've got some people coming in. So I am gonna jump back into the screen share, which will make me a little smaller and the PowerPoint much bigger. So it's a good way to, good way to start. So we've got a lot of people signed up today. So we're excited about that. I uh, decided to open the doors a little earlier to get some folks in and, um, we got a few things to cover, so I'm uh, I'm super excited about it. So uh, this is uh, the third month of this program that we've been doing, and I know we have some agents, meaning realtors, that are signed up uh, to check out what we're doing here. And one of the things that I offer the agents that do uh, come is if they want to do this as a joint venture, joint marketing, we'll be glad to do that with them. This one is one that we just do on a monthly basis, and we do this back with our own clientele, people that we've pre-approved, people we're talking uh, to about getting into a home, and this thing is uh, it's a lot of fun for me, so I, I like doing this. Uh, we will not have a home buyer's presentation in December. Our next one is going to be in January, and as our normal schedule, we'll do it January, likely on a weekend. So usually Saturday from nine to 10, and then the following month, we'll go back to doing it on a weeknight, and then the pattern just continues. So we figured some folks who maybe can't come on a Saturday morning can come check it out on a weeknight and vice versa. So, so that's good. So it's 5.30, and uh, I'm going to cover some of the basic things here uh, and get into it. So first of all, if you're looking to buy a home, you're in the right place. We're going to cover a lot of really good information here. Uh, ultimately, though, this is about you guys. So I want to make sure I got the chat box open. Good. So Tony is my assistant. She's amazing. We don't do this without her. That's for a fact. If you're interested in asking questions, you'll be able to do that in the chat box. So Tony's going to go ahead and say hello to everybody in the chat box so you know where to go with your questions. And then I'm going to kick a screen off here. We're going to go to the next screen. Just give you guys a little bit of information about myself, and then we'll get into the program, which should be in about a minute or so. Myself, I've been in the business for over 30 years. I have uh, stopped counting after 30 years, otherwise I date myself, but been in the mortgage space for a long time, really focus on purchases, been doing that for a long time. The company that I'm with in January, I will be with Cross Country Mortgage for 10 years. When I joined the company 10 years ago, we had less than 250 employees. When we close out the year this year, we'll have over 7,000. We, as a company, sell our loans directly to Fannie Mae, directly to Freddie Mac, and directly to Jenny Mae. Jenny Mae is the entity that provides money for FHA, VA, USDA loans. By selling direct, it gives us a little bit more flexibility in the sense that we are here to make the loans the way they're intended to be make, made. That is, we don't have extra rules or guidelines. In our industry, it's called an overlay. An overlay is when a lender says, well, we're not going to do any FHA loans under 620. FHA uh, goes down to 500 in a credit score. So FHA is pretty aggressive. And as long as FHA will insure it, and we're making a good loan to the borrower, we are graded on that loan's ability to perform. So we we'll want to make a good loan to the borrower. We're going to go ahead and follow FHA guidelines accordingly. So we also service our own loans. Our company is based in Cleveland, Ohio. However, the loans are serviced right here out of the Chicagoland area. If you have a question about something that goes on with servicing, whether it's something about taxes or something, you can always call us back here at our local branch. With that, just glance at the clock, we're at about 532, so we're going to jump into the program. Again, this program is for you guys, so if you have questions, please put them in the chat box, and we're going to get right into our subject matter here. So, the agenda, things we're going to cover today is renting versus owning. We're going to cover uh, bonus to buying, 
assessing, putting a plan together, the mental and uh, emotional items that are involved here, also some of the financial aspects and put a roadmap together for you. So we're gonna get right into it here. Renting versus buying. So first thing we wanna talk about is tax benefits. It is claimed that there's been tax benefits for a really, really long time, the home ownership, where you can write off your mortgage interest, you can write off your real estate taxes. Under the last administration, they limited some of those write-offs, but then they gave the taxpayers a much larger standard deduction. So ultimately, the ability to itemize taxes and insurance kind of went away. So the tax benefits right now currently under the last administration's plans are really as significant. Now, this administration has proposed raising some of the limits on things that you can deduct. And again, which is your real estate taxes are deductible and your inter mortgage interest you pay is deductible. They raise some of those limits. It may bring back some of the tax advantages to home ownership. Don't worry, there's plenty of good reasons to own a home outside of the tax benefits. So the next bullet point that we have here talks about building equity and wealth. Couple things that I want to talk to you about there. 90%, 90, 90% of all millionaires started with some sort of real estate, whether it was their primary residence, investment property, 90%. It's a huge number. Owning a home is a path, an excellent way to accumulate wealth. I had a couple other notes. Oh, the other thing that I wanted to point out here. The other thing about the building wealth and equity. So let's just talk about how far your dollar goes. Let's say, and we're gonna use round numbers for example, but it'll make sense, it'll, it'll make sense that way. If the purchase price on a home is $100,000 and as a buyer, you're coming in to purchase that home with 5% down. At 5% down, that's $5,000. If the home appreciates only 7%, which in the last year, some of the appreciation we've seen is closer to 20%. It's been very, very high. Let's just assume we'll be conservative. The house appreciates at 7% over the next 12 months. That means now that $100,000 house that you purchased is worth $107,000. But what's more dramatic is that your investment in that house was only the $5,000. So in a matter of 12 months, you made $7,000 on your $5,000 investment and you have a roof over your head. That's a return, by the way, of 140%. Keep in mind, the appreciation is based not on your down payment, but on the value of the home itself. That's one of the reasons that this is an excellent way to accumulate wealth. The next point that we have here, we talk about pride of ownership, and really it boils down to it's yours. When you're making the repairs, you're making the repairs for yourself. When you're painting it, you're painting it for yourself. You're not making repairs for a landlord or wait for your landlord to send a handyman out to fix it. It's not a lot of pride and ownership in that when somebody's just coming out and making sure something's functional versus something that actually looks good that you can actually be proud of. The next part we talk about here is family and stability. It is a fact that children who are in homes where the parents own the home versus children that come from rental properties, the children that are in homes have much higher cognitive test scores and less behavior problems. Not sure why that is, but ultimately those are the facts. And you can go ahead and research that, but I think that stability for your children is very, very important. Next thing we talk about, it's yours. So ultimately, the number of animals that you have, whether or not you can have animals, you're gonna paint the room pink, you're gonna do something with, you're gonna put a vegetable garden out back. You, for the most part, don't have to ask anybody's permission. So that's great. So you've got properties yours, you can do what you want with it. Let's move on to the next slide. And okay, so one of the other things as far as the, the mental and the uh, emotional portions of this, I wanna get up to my notes. So 
we'll jump right into this. We do make a note in here about putting a plan together. It is important that if you are thinking about doing this, even if you're thinking about doing this in the spring, the sooner you talk to a mortgage professional, the better. There may be some things that you can use the next five or six months to get better prepared, whether it's accumulation of documentation, whether it's getting your taxes in order, whether it's making sure you have enough money, the sooner that you know what you need, always the better. All right, so the next part is, the important part on this buying path or journey that you're gonna be on is what is your why? Why is it that you're doing this? Are you trying to buy a home that's actually closer to your work? Are you trying to get into a good school system for your kids? Are you trying to use this property as a stepping stone to start creating wealth? Maybe you'll be in the property for one to four years and you'll turn around and rent it and go buy something else. And this will be the beginning of a rental portfolio. What is your why? It's really important to know why that you're gonna do this. Um, it's gonna be challenging. So as it's challenging, sometimes you may have to go back and reflect on why am I going through this? And, and what am I, why am I doing this? So do you plan on staying for more than a few years? So specifically, and I saw a, mess, a question come up in the chat. I will cover that after we get through the slide. And I thank you for as, asking the question. Are you, per, uh, sorry, are you planning on staying in the house for more than a few years? I would tell you personally, if you're not gonna be there for at least three years, buying a home is not a really good decision. There's some costs to sell. And sometimes if you know it could be three years, it might be two, it might be less. That's a situation where you may just want to rent, especially if you're looking at a job relocation, you're gonna be moving out of state or something like that. So at least know that you should be in the house a minimum of three years for the purchase to make sense. Are you purchasing with a partner or somebody that you're gonna be sharing this commitment with? Now, there's a couple different types of partnerships that you can have. Marriage is one thing because you've made some long-term commitments to be together. What, we're, what this bullet point really addresses is, you're gonna buy this house with a friend, are you gonna buy this house with a relative, are you gonna buy this house with a boyfriend or a girlfriend? If that is the situation, then there needs to be a contingency plan ahead of time if one of you decides that this situation is no longer good for them. Maybe you're buying with a relative and then they find a spouse or companion and they wanna move on. If you haven't discussed this ahead of time, now is the time to have that conversation. How are we going to exit this if one of us wants to stay and the other one wants to leave? This is a good time to address that. And lastly, on this slide, how much work are you gonna be able to put into the home? So if you're not handy, I'm not particularly handy. I like some stuff. I really like plumbing. I like electrical. But if you're not handy, what are you really willing to do? And if you're not willing to put your own effort and energy in, do you have a little bit of money aside? Or do you have some relatives or friends that you can count on if you need some help? So this is a consideration. Houses, they need work as, as, as we move forward. So please you know, keep that in mind. All right, in the chat, we have Marie has asked, um, I've had two people ask about the $15,000 Home Buyer Act of 2021. Has this been passed for first time home buyers to use? I've also heard about it. To the best of my knowledge, it has not been passed. We've been talking about that for probably six months. So to the best of my knowledge, that has not been passed um, and certainly, we will get that out to our realtor partners as soon as that comes out. And I imagine it'll be in the media, but right now for the moment, it hasn't passed. That's an interesting uh, credit because I think some even in our industry questioned it because it's really potentially bringing more buyers into a market that has lots and lots of buyers, maybe not a lot of inventory. So I think there might've been a little bit of pushback on that because it, it maybe isn't really market appropriate at this time. There are other down payment assistance products out there. The state of Illinois has IDA, which is Illinois Housing Development Authority. The acronym is IDA. You can get up to $10,000 there. 
There are some other programs where you can get three and a half percent to five and five percent towards your purchase price. So there's some other existing plans out there, and we can cover those uh, a little later. Hopefully, I answered your question on that, Marie. All right. So financially think like a lender. We're going to go through all of this, um, but we're going to cover credit. We're going to cover the survival number, cash. We're going to cover income and debt to income ratio over the next couple of slides. First and foremost, we cover credit. So with regards to credit, with regards to credit, Fair Isaac is a company that actually creates the credit score that companies use to determine whether or not they're going to be willing to lend to. By the way, Fair Isaac is really not the credit reports. Fair Isaac takes information from the three major credit reporting agencies, which are Experian, Equifax, and TransUnion. Then they have a formula that is universally acceptable in the mortgage industry, and they generate a score. The score really boils down to a predictability of risk. So the higher the score, the less risky the borrower is and the less likely to default. That's really what a mortgage company wants to know. How much of a risk am I taking to lend to this borrower? What goes into the score is what we're going to cover here. The biggest part of the score, not shocking, is how you pay your bills. The payment history, it's 35%. So that part's pretty easy. The next part, though, not so easy, is the amount owed. Well, what does that mean? One of the things that they look at is how much money do you owe versus what your actual credit limit is on your credit card. And it's a percentage that they're looking for, not the dollar amount. So here's an example. If you only owe $250 on a department store card, but the department store card limit is only $250, in the eyes of FICO or Fair Isaac, you're maxed out. As a maxed out consumer, that card, that maxed out little department score card could cost 40 to 50 points on your score. So it's not necessarily the dollar amount as much as how much do you owe versus how much the limit is. If you have a $10,000 card and you only owe $250, that's outstanding. You're gonna have really good credit from that particular card. So it's always important to keep lower balances relative to your credit limits. There's some tricks and things that you can do. If you've had a credit card for a while, one of the things you could potentially do is call them, see if they can increase your limits. That sometimes has helped people open up some credit availability, which will help their credit scores, opening up some new accounts. The one thing that you don't wanna do with credit cards is close them. One of the things that, that's here on our third uh, point here is the 15% is the length of time you've actually had the credit. So you've got a seven to 10 year old credit card. You decide, okay, they told me I shouldn't have any balances. I'm just gonna pay all this stuff off. Losing that seven to 10 year old credit card could cost you points on your credit and could be as much as 20, 30 points on your credit. So you want to, providing they're not charging you some ridiculous annual fee, you want to keep them open and you want to keep a little bit of activity tone. A couple of the things that are mentioned here, 10% of what goes into your score is the type of credit that you use. So there's credit specifically, they look at maybe the types of companies. If you're using finance companies, where we know that the interest rates that are being offered are much higher than normal than a bank, that could be the type of credit that is actually weighs against your credit score. So whether or not you even have open revolving credit cards, if you don't have open revolving credit cards, that actually, while you might think it's great, hey, I'm not using any charge cards, it actually doesn't help your credit score. And last but not least, 10% of it is new credit. When Fair Isaac or FICO determines credit scores, how they figured out how to create this formula is they went back and looked at, let's say, a million credit scores where the people defaulted and they didn't pay their bills. And then they rewound those credit reports about a year before and they started looking for what are the things that were happening that would give us indicators that these folks might not be able to perform in the future. 
One of the things were when somebody gets in trouble, they start scrambling around and applying for a lot of different credit. So it doesn't mean you can't have your credit pulled to get a mortgage. It just means that if there's a lot of different inquiries for a lot of different types of credit, that could potentially hurt you. All right, so we'll go on to the next slide where we start talking about the credit scoring range. These, these credit scores that are listed here are probably a good example of what Fannie Mae considers good credit scores and Freddie Mac. Those are the companies that give us conventional lending. Actually, Fannie and Freddie will start to increase the rate a little bit if you go below 760. So that's kind of their high watermark. With FHA, you're really not going to see any sort of increase in interest rate unless you're south or under 640. But these are some pretty good examples. Now keep in mind, this is an example for mortgages. If you were to apply for a car, a house, and a credit card on the same day, you're gonna have three di entirely different scoring models. So this, what we're focusing on here is mortgage. If you're getting your credit score from Capital One or Credit Karma, typically they're not using a mortgage score because it's one of the most expensive to get, they're using some of the cheaper scores to acquire, which would be like credit card scores. And the other thing to keep in mind relative to these scores is that the lower your score, you're not only gonna potentially pay more money in interest, but you might pay more money in homeowner's insurance. A lot of homeowner's insurance companies will pull credit because they know that a lower credit score has a higher probability of turning in claims and potentially you could pay more. So it's really important to focus on your credit. We talked about this before. It's really important to get with your lender ahead of time. So if there's things you can do to improve your score, it helps all the way across the board. Okay, so one in five Americans find some issues on their credit report. So again, the sooner we can get eyes on it, the sooner we can figure out what those errors might be and the sooner you could start working on it. Working on those credit errors can take some time. There is a credit restoration company that we refer to. Jim Drusky with Illinois Credit out of Plainfield does an amazing job. He's helped our clients for over a dozen years. He's local, in, uh, very experienced, I should say, inexpensive is what I was about to say. He's also been an expert witness in federal court as it relates to credit. So it's a great guy, great reference for us. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'll have Tony put some contact information for him in the chat box. And again, please send questions that you have. Next, we have monthly survival number. I think this is really important. When we start out talking to a consumer, if, if they don't know how much that they want to buy, like, hey, I want to put it on you, Rich. You tell me how much I can afford. That's not really a good program. I'm going to tell you why because I don't know about the other things that you have in your world outside of your credit report. We're gonna look at your credit report, but here's some of the things that credit doesn't tell me. It doesn't tell me that you have childcare. It doesn't tell me if you have some sort of medical bill that, or a prescription that you have to pay extra money for. It doesn't tell me that you might be paying some sort of tuition because you're going to college at night. It doesn't tell me those things. So. You know, we've got this nice little uh, screenshot here that you could take that kind of helps you put together a monthly survival number. You should really know, use this to determine how much you're spending and then maybe how much you can budget for a mortgage payment. One of the things we try to help folks with is if you're renting and your rent is, let's say, $1,500 a month and they don't really know how much they want to qualify for, the question becomes, are you comfortable paying 1500? Yeah, I'm really comfortable paying it. Okay, would you be comfortable if your rent payment was 1800? Eh, okay, great. Let's focus on how much 1500 a month qualifies you for. So that, that's an important place for us to start. You should definitely be looking at how much money you're spending. If you're not renting and you're living with relatives, then look how much money you're, you're saving on a monthly basis because essentially, Whatever you're saving will be going towards a mortgage payment down the road. All right. So next we talk about how much money that you're going to need in this transaction. First part, of course, is down payment. Big misconception is I have to have 20% down. I still hear it today. 
It's crazy. You do not need 20% down to get into a house. As a matter of fact, if you think about that example that I gave originally, where I talked about a $100,000 house with $5,000 down, and that buyer made 140%, well, if they're putting down $20,000 and then making only $7,000 on the house, their actually rate of return is a lot less than somebody putting down a little bit less. So just kind of an interesting, uh, interesting numbers thing. So uh, Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, which basically those two agencies get the money from Wall Street and they send it to Main Street or us mortgage lenders so we can lend out. Their minimum down is 3%. Their maximum loan, which I want to cover this um, ultimately because that number is going to go up in 2022. There's a lot of lenders, including ourselves, that have already raised that number up to 625,000. We feel that'll be the limit. Anything north of 625 is going to be considered a jumbo. We'll talk about that in a second. Government loans, FHA, VA, USDA. FHA requires three and a half down in almost every case. And then the VA and the USDA are no money down. VA is Veterans Administration. So it's for folks that have served and have what they call a certificate of eligibility. And then the USDA or rural development is not for farms. Very common misconception. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here because it covers the outskirts. Um, areas like Harvard, areas like uh, Marengo, those would qualify potentially for a USDA loan that wouldn't require any money down. Last part in here is Jumbo. Jumbo, now we've described it, any loan over 625, uh, they now have product with as little as 5% down on Jumbos. We actually have a product with 3.5% down on a Jumbo under a million. So really aggressive programs here. And we're gonna cover a little bit more about how much money you need. On the next slide. So, closing costs. So that's another big thing. People think, well, hey, I just I've got my five percent or I got my twenty percent. I'm good. Closing costs, especially here in the Chicagoland area, we're not the most expensive, believe it or not, but we're certainly going to be more expensive than if you're in Rockford, if you go up to Wisconsin or in Indiana. We have some expensive closing costs here in the Chicagoland area. Typically, as the slide said, it could be two to 5%. We're going to talk about what goes into that on the next slide. So here's some expenses that you can kind of count on. Now, just for round numbers, we usually tell people to expect about six or 7,000 in closing costs. Now we're going to break those down. One thing that's not considered, as a matter of fact, those first two lines on the slide, they're not technically considered closing costs because that's money that you're going to need up front. Let's talk about the home inspection first. If you're not handy or you don't have somebody that's in the trades in your family, even if you do, because maybe those folks that are in the trades you can't count on, get a home inspection. That's going to be something you pay for. Now, as a lender, I don't want to see it. I don't require it. However, we highly recommend it. Get a home inspection. It's going to tell you whether or not you're buying a house that's got inherently big problems. So home inspection, you know, you're not worried about not worried about whether or not the dishwasher runs or if the window doesn't quite open. Sure, those are things that you're going to have to fix. All homes have little bugs that need to be fixed. What you're more concerned about is roof, very expensive. Foundation, really expensive. The big ticket items that could be really, really costly. That's what you're going to pay a home inspector for. I've given you a range. Typically, your real estate agent has somebody uh, that they highly recommend that looks out for their clients, and that's where I would tell you to go for that referral. Next, we talk about the appraisal. That is something we require. You're going to pay an appraisal management company. Typically, it's actually in this market anywhere from 450 to 500. That's one of the areas. Be glad you're in this market. In California, because of the shortage of appraisers, People are paying $1,100 or more just to guarantee they get an appraisal in under 30 days. So here in the Chicago market, we're a little bit fortunate in that regard. $450, $500 should cover your appraisal fee. But again, it's not part of your closing costs. 
the other part of money that you're going to need ahead of time, that's not mentioned here, but it's not a closing cost either. You're going to need to have some money set aside for earnest money. Earnest money, traditionally, we'll just say $1,000. If you start getting into higher price homes, your real estate agent might say, hey, in this price range, we recommend a higher check to be given to the seller to show good faith that we, in fact, are serious about closing this deal. Next, we've got homeowner's insurance. So homeowner's insurance, as mentioned here, could be $600 to $1,800. A lot of it depends on the property type. A lot of it depends on what you're going to insure. Are you going to have basement backup insurance? Are you, do you have an art collection? Do you have other things that, that are expensive to insure? The lower end is probably something you're going to see more like in a townhouse or a condo where the association might have insurance to cover the majority of the property and you're responsible for the things inside, you'll see some cheaper insurance there. This is a really good time if you do not care for the company you're using for your car insurance to shop that at the same time. Car insurance and homeowner insurance combined will be cheaper than if you have it with two different companies. But that'll be on, on you as far as you shopping for that. that premium or that amount of money is due at the time of closing, we want to make sure your home is insured. I do have a, a loan that we closed where the day it closed, a tree literally fell on the house. So it is important to make sure when you close, you have insurance. It didn't cost our client anything other than the inconvenience of having a tree sticking through his house, but it happened the day that he closed. So we've got to get that insurance in place. All right, attorney, we are in an attorney state. Again, very uh, few states around us. Yeah, Wisconsin is not an attorney state. We are. If you buy property in Wisconsin and you bring an attorney, they say, oh, you're from Illinois. So that being said, an attorney, you will need an attorney to represent you to do a couple of things. Number one, they do review the contract to make sure that the con you're not committing to anything that you're not comfortable with. Number two, if there's any issues in the home inspection that's typically negotiated between the two attorneys, if there's any issues with the closing date, if there's any issues with the final walkthrough, and then that attorney is typically the one that explains all the documents at closing to you. Next, you've got lender's fees. Our lender's fees, uh, that covers underwriting, processing, tax service, pretty standard. We're about $1,500 um, for those fees. Title. Title, as you see, $2,500 to $3,750. Title is very expensive. I don't order the title for you guys. You don't get to pick the title company. There's some guidelines that would allow you to do that. For the most case, 99% of title is chosen by the seller. The seller's attorney picks the title company. That's where I send money. That's where you guys go close. Your bill from title, right now, we're seeing an average of about $3,200. Transfer tax. So this is something as an example, if you buy in the city of Chicago, they charge a one-time fee of $7.50 per thousand. So $750 per hundred thousand. And I think we got an example on the slide here. If you bought a $400,000 home, you're going to pay $3,000 in a one-time tax to the city of Chicago. So these are, and some, by the way, some other communities will have transfer taxes. Outside of Chicago, most communities either A, don't have them, or they're much, much less. Hillside, I believe, is still $7.50 per thousand. So again, you figure your down payment plus about six to 7000 covers closing costs. Before we get into income, I want to talk about some places that you can get some assistance towards your closing costs. One place traditionally has always been the seller. We can go back to the seller and say, hey, Here's our offer to buy your home, but we need $2,000 towards our closing cost or 2% of the purchase price. Let's say it's a $300,000 offer. You want 2%. That's like six grand. In this market, we haven't seen as much of that because typically you're going to be competing against other buyers and you might have another buyer standing right behind you that wants the house as much as you do and doesn't need the closing cost. So that's not been a place where we've seen as much assistance in the last two years as we have in the past. One way to determine that is how long has the property been on the market? 
property's been on the market for 60 days, 90 days. Now you may be able to start negotiating some things to help yourself out with closing costs. Another way to help out with closing costs is to talk to your lender and your lender potentially can charge a higher rate of interest. When I charge a higher rate of interest to the buyer, I get paid more by Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac to deliver that loan. Now, we are set in what we can make as a loan officer. So it, if I charge you a higher interest rate, I have to give you that extra money back. So it's another way where you can maybe pick up a couple thousand dollars or more towards your closing costs. Now you're gonna pay a little bit higher, maybe it costs you an extra 20 bucks a month, but you found an extra four to $5,000 to help out with closing costs. Okay. Um, now we talk about income. What do we need to do as a lender? We need to assess your ability to repay. We're required by law to assess your ability to repay. Do you have a consistent work history? So we have to go back two years. Doesn't necessarily mean you have to work that entire two years, but we need to know what you were doing that last two years. If you're in school, hey, cool, it's fine. You had a little bit of a job gap because of the pandemic, no problem. We as a lender are gonna ask for some sort of letter. Hey, I was out of work, I'm in the food service industry and we couldn't, we were closed. Um, again, this is one of the reasons it's important to talk to your lender first. If you have any inconsistencies going on with your job, if it's not salary, I would say you need to talk to your lender because hourly folks have some challenges when their hours aren't guaranteed. You've had some job changes. Talk to your lender. Really, really important point. After you buy the house, meaning you go under contract before you close, do not change jobs. So whatever you do, don't change jobs. Sometimes you don't have a choice. So sometimes you may have to do that, but you need to put your lender on notice immediately when you know that's going on. Uh, we will, we're required to verify employment the day before you close, even sometimes the day you close. So that's not something you should ever keep from your lender. Get them wired in, let them know what's going on. And uh, it's that part's really important. Okay, so debt to income ratio. So what is it? So how much, monthly debt you're carrying versus your gross monthly income, not net. We don't, we don't use net in our terms. So if you're, uh, we'll do this as, yeah, so everything else 57. Okay, so we have two numbers that we traditionally use. We use what's called a housing debt ratio. So how much is your mortgage payment compared to your income? And then how much is your mortgage payment plus other credit debt, car loans, credit cards, student loans, alimony, child support, that type of thing. How much is that compared? Here's an example of how to do this. Let's say you were making $4,000 a month. We set you up with the mortgage payment that's $1,000 all in, principal, taxes, association, homeowners association, that's a thousand bucks. If I take your 4,000 and I divide it into the thousand, I got 25%. Your front end debt ratio is 25%. If your other debts, so let's say your student loans, your car payments, any credit cards that you have are another $1,000. So now your total household debt is about $2,000. Again, I take the income of four, divide it into the two, I've got 50%. So if I was gonna go talk to an underwriter or somebody in my industry, we'd say, hey, their ratios are 25 over 50. Hopefully that makes sense. Ideally, you want to keep your debt ratios total under 50. Fannie Mae sometimes requires that we stay under 45. If you're looking for down payment assistance from IDA, they typically request that we keep the total debt under 45% of the gross monthly income. So any income questions, please fire those off. I try to cover that as simply as I can but that should help you when you're designing a budget. Uh, let's see here. Oh, good, we got another question that came in. Um, okay, good. So uh, what is minimum income? We get somebody approved for a mortgage, $12 an hour with low debt to income ratio. Can somebody get a loan for $40,000 for cross country to purchase a property? Okay, so at $12 an hour, my calculator really quick. There we go. So $12 an hour, assuming the borrower was working 40 hours guaranteed, 
and uh, 40 hours a week guaranteed, that's going to be an annual income of $24,960. How did I do that so quick? It's 2,080 hours worked in a year times 12. It's $24,960. But divide that number by 12, you've got about $2,000 uh, a month in gross income. And again, if I want to keep everything under 45%, I just take the $2,080 divided by 45%. I could spend potentially on all our credit debt about 936 bucks a month. We did it that fast. I don't expect you guys to be able to do it that fast, but to answer the question, um, $936 is probably about the most for all debt. The follow-up question that Marie had is, can somebody get a loan for $40,000 with cross country to purchase a property? Regrettably, the answer is no. Uh, the reason it answers no is because there are some laws within the state of Illinois that prevent us from doing smaller loans. I would love to do these loans. Unfortunately, they have some uh, rules that cap what the closing costs are as a percentage of the loan. And when the closing costs are static, or like, if you buy a $40,000 home or a $400,000 home, the title fees are still what the title fees are. The appraisal fees still $450 to $500. Those costs are fixed. When we start comparing them based on a loan amount, certain laws state, hey, you as the lender can't make those loans, but if you do, you have to pay the difference. Well, we can't afford to pay the difference. So regrettably, I can't do a $40,000 loan. A lot of banks don't like doing $40,000 loan, but if you call enough of them, you'll find somebody that will do it. Um, a lot of banks will have minimums. We have a minimum. Our minimum on a conventional loan is about $50,000 for a loan that we felt that we could do that and not end up having to pay a lot of money um, or just not do the loan. Um, so hopefully that answered your question. We talked about some tips to improving your debt ratio, certainly paying down some credit uh, may help. So if you've got a couple payments left on an installment loan, you can pay that off. There's some things that you can do. Again, you'd want to work with us, uh, work with the mortgage professional on some ideas what might be able to help stretch the amount of money that you can spend on a mortgage payment. Speaking of mortgage payment, this is what goes into a mortgage payment. If you've ever heard the word P-I-T-I -I or pity, pity payment, it's principal, it's interest, it's taxes, and it's insurance. That's essentially what PITI means or P-I-T-I. Now, the other part of it that's in here is mortgage insurance. So mortgage insurance, when people hear insurance, they're thinking, hey, this is covering me for something. It's not covering you for anything. It's actually covering the lender because you're not coming into the table, coming to the table with 20% down. So you do get somewhat of a benefit you're able to buy a house with less than 20% down, but the insurance is actually to the lender if you default. Here's what happens. You come to the table with 5% down, the, they write an insurance, PMI or private mortgage insurance, one of those many companies writes a policy and that policy insures the lender down to 72% loan to value. So we're actually, our exposure, is only 72% of the purchase price. We've got an insurance policy that covers the difference between your 5% and the 72%. Again, your benefit, and you're gonna pay for it, typically PMI is paid on a monthly basis, so it gets added to your PITEI, but your benefit is you don't have to save the 20%. Ultimately, I would tell you not to wait to save the 20% because two things happen while you're trying to save that money. Number one, appreciation. These houses keep getting more expensive. Number two, rates may go up. And that seems to be the trend currently. So while you're scrambling to save 20% today, you may need even more down the road because the house is going to be worth a little bit more. One last thing is a housing cost is mentioned here. If you're looking at a townhouse or a condominium, uh, you're going to be looking at homeowners association dues. A lot of times they will cover the major insurance, but as we mentioned, you still have to get insurance for the inside, what's inside the condo, but homeowners association is considered in our world part of your housing. All right, next we've got here, all right, the roadmap, this is good. So we're gonna talk about all the different people 
that you're going to be working with in here. And you're going to have a team. Hopefully you have a great team that you can trust. It's really important to have good teammates. Loan officer, of course, that's us. That's the lender. The real estate agent. So real estate agents, uh, you know, I tell you how to find a real estate agent. You want a real estate agent that really does, that, in my opinion, their job is three things. Their job is to show you a home and list you a home. That's number one. The next part of the job is to negotiate. They have to be really good at negotiating because they're the ones that are going to try to get you the best price, try to try to get them to make some of the repairs. You want a good negotiator. And last part of their job is to mitigate risk. So they are there to make sure you don't get in trouble. They're the professionals, the ones you're paying. So they're there to mitigate risk. All right, appraisers. So that's not necessarily part of your team, but as part of my team, that appraiser, by the way, his job is to tell me that the value you're paying is good for me and give me a description of what my collateral is. That appraiser is there. There's nothing. You do get a copy of it. We will give you a copy of your appraisal, but it's got nothing to do with checking the pipes, checking the property foundation, none of that stuff. It's basically the only thing an appraiser is going to do is point out the obvious like if the, he's walking through water in the basement, it's going to end up on the appraisal, but he's not crawling. You know, he's not going to basically look at the little fine points that a home inspector is going to. Title company. So why do you need a title company? I already said that you're not even going to be able to pick who the title company is, but they're a very important part. Aside from closing your loan, they're also going to make sure you get clean title. They're going to make sure that the seller had the right to sell the property to you and they're going to make sure that all the liens are taken care of and paid. You're not only the rightful owner, but you don't owe any of the other debt. As a matter of fact, you are going to get insurance policy against that. So if some old debt comes up or something like that, you go right to your insurance policy and say, hey, I got insurance against whatever this debt is. Home inspector, we talked about what their job is. And then the homeowner's insurance agents, again, you love your car agent, use your car agent. If you don't love your car insurance agent or don't even know who it is, now's the time to find somebody and get a good relationship. But these are the folks you're gonna need. All right, meet with your lender. We've already talked about this. Meet with us six to 12 months ahead of time. There's so much stuff we have to work on. We gotta make sure your credit's good. We gotta make sure you've got your documentation squared away. And we definitely have to make sure you're prepared for the cash that you're going to need. Pre-qualification versus pre-approval. Say it simply this. You call me up and you say, hey, Rich, I make $100,000 a year. I've got a 780 credit score. I want to buy a $300,000 house. I got 70 grand in the bank. Am I good? Sounds great to me. Guess what? Officially, you're pre-qualified. Here's the problem with that. There isn't a real estate agent in the world that would take a pre-qualification certificate because they know it's not backed by anything than a phone conversation. That's why you really need to be pre-approved. Pre-approved is this. You've given us a full application. We've ran your credit and we've went and pulled what's called automated underwriting. So they take the information from your application plus your credit and they give us an approval. That is a much more acceptable form to show the seller that you, in fact, are ready to close. Now, here across country, we do something a little bit different. After the pre-approval, we will go ahead and gather your documentation that supports the application, and we will actually submit it like you found a home. And our underwriter and processors will do all the same due diligence and we're going to come back to you guys and say, guess what? You're approved subject to the home appraising and us getting clean title. And that's a very powerful approval to have when you're in a competitive market. So we strongly recommend that you do that. If you work with me, we do that standard to all of our applicants. Immediately, you're approved. We're asking for documents so we can complete that next process. All right. So we've got... We talked about the other pre-approval. In the pre-approval process, we're gonna go over what your payments are. You're gonna have more buying power because you are approved. We're gonna avoid any setbacks that you might have, maybe some information that you've gotta go ask a relative for to explain something. 
Let's do that now and not do that when we're 20 days away from closing. So this is also gonna save you a little bit of time. This, excuse me, this covers, this covers some of the things that we're gonna need. So we're gonna need paycheck stubs, we're gonna need tax returns, we're gonna need a couple months worth of bank statements, we're definitely gonna need a photo ID and we definitely need to run credit. That stuff's pretty basic, but these are the things you're gonna be have to provide to your lender in order to get approved. So what's the next step? Well, you're gonna find a home, you work with your agents, and basically, you know, some of the things you wanna know, uh, you know, give them an idea of exactly what you're looking for. Are you handy? Are you willing to take on somebody else's uh, bumped and beat up home? Or do you need something to be kind of in better shape uh, for you? Uh, what are the property taxes? They'll help you out with their crime rates in the area, quality of schools they've access. They will send you links to places that you can go look up so you can get that. Now, you found your dream home and you basically just need to make an offer. Again, this is where having a good real estate agent's important. Your offer is gonna come with our pre-approval letter or our fast track, which is our fully underwritten letter. And you're gonna work with your agents so uh, work with your agent to negotiate a good price that you're comfortable with. You're not only gonna be working on the price, but you're also gonna be working on the closing date. A lot of things to discuss with the agent at that time. All right, uh, then you get back to us when you apply for the mortgage. Once you have a seller signed contract, notify your lender immediately. We may not necessarily start the mortgage because we want to make sure you get through the home inspection port part of it. So the home inspection part is important because I don't want to spend your appraisal money and find out the property never passed the home inspection. So let us know, let your lender know as soon as you have a seller signed contract. However, we may not get started until you clear the home inspection just to make sure that's okay. Now. Do's and don'ts to home buying. Uh, I was actually with a bunch of realtors yesterday and they want me to create this form on, and they're gonna do it on their letterhead, but it's basically something where the buyer signs and promises not to do some of the things we're gonna cover. So any changes of employment or compensation is really, really important. So you stay with the company, which we already told you, stay with your company, but they come to you and say, hey, we're gonna put you on your commission. You have a chance to make a, 10 times more, you're now a newly commissioned employee, we may not be able to use any of that income because you don't have a track record. So changes of employment and compensation are really important to talk to us about. Maybe we can put that job off until we have to close, whatever that opportunity is. Continue to pay your rent, your mortgage, and your credit cards. Uh, I have seen this where somebody is working with us. They're like, hey, I gotta pay down this car. I pay down the car. And then we find out a little bit later, we pre-approved them, but maybe they didn't go to contract for four months and we pull their credit and we're like, what happened to your credit card payments? Well, I used the money to pay off my car. No, 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 no. Continue to pay everything else on time. Really, really critically important. Any major money movements have to be well documented. So major money movements would be considered anything over and above a paycheck stub. Put $100 here, $200 here, that's fine. If your normal net check is $500 a pay period and all of a sudden $2,000 shows up, we're gonna ask where that money came from. Proper paper trailing. Somebody gives you a gift, cool. We're gonna take a photocopy of the check they gave you and we're gonna get a gift letter over to you and the donor so we know that it was truly a gift. Those are just one of the things that could come up. Um, changes in your finances. Uh, I had a situation where we had a client who she got a car accident on 290. She called me first because she was worried getting a new car payment would actually impact the house that she was closing on in two weeks. She, they, she let other people in the accident call the tow truck and the ambulance and the police. It's crazy. But she did, she did the right thing, but she could have waited. She just wanted to make sure the payment, which was basically going to be the same payment that she had on the car that she just wrecked, was going to be the same. Fortunately, not only was she okay, she got a new car, she got her house and all that, but I was super shocked she called me. But it is really important. She called me that soon, I should say. 
it was really important to let us know if you have any changes in finances. And let's make sure we don't have any surprises. Um, travel plans during the application process. This is kind of interesting. We've had a situation where somebody went to contract and they left for two weeks and we couldn't get the documentation we needed to start our process. So if you have any travel plans during the time that you went to contract and closed, please let us know when you're not going to be available so we can be proactive and try to get as much as we can and be prepared for the time that we're just not going to be able to have maybe even contact with you, depending on what part of the world that you're in. The don'ts, don't quit your job. We already talked about that. Don't co-sign for anybody. I wouldn't co-sign for anybody anyway, but certainly not when you're doing this. So co-signing more often than not doesn't really, I've seen it not work out for people. Um, transition your current employment to self-employed. Now is not the time to be an independent contractor. You want to do that, do that after you close, but you want to stay on the job that you have that we use to get you approved. Um, apply and close out credit cards. We talked about it. New credit could be problematic. Certainly closing credit cards is problematic for sure. It's okay to pay something off after you talk to your mortgage professional, but don't pay it off before that. We might actually need to see that money in your bank. That might've been a component of what we needed to get you approved. In other words, the automated underwriting might have liked the fact that you had an extra 10 grand in the bank after everything was closed, but you decided to take the 10 grand and pay off a $10,000 Chase account. And now we don't have that money in the bank. I've seen not having that extra money in the bank be a reason that I can't get somebody approved. So this is not the time. If you're gonna pay something down, certainly talk to us first. Got a couple of the bullet points and we'll address what came in the chat box. Um, certainly try not to max out credit cards because we talked about had having that having a negative impact. Um, any large purchases, I, I just went through this with a client. He needed to buy, he really wanted to buy a truck and called me almost every day up to his closing and said, look, I really need to do this. Can I do it now? Can I do it now? And literally, once he had the keys and it was closed, he was able to do that. Um, he was using the truck to move across uh, country, relocating from Illinois to Arizona. So uh, let's see here. Move money. Uh, oh, so don't move funds from account to account. It's okay if you do, just paper trail it. All right. So we've got uh, the purchaser has a 520 credit score with the down payment of 10% for FHA with cross country. Right. Purchase has some Oh, um, so FHA does allow credit scores down to 500. Once you go below 580, they require at least 10% down. Now we here at cross country do those loans. I have done loans here in my career with cross country under 580. So yes, 10% down would be acceptable. Um, if an installment loan has less than 10 payments, does it get factored into the debt to income ratio? That's a great question. Um, I can't see who asked that question, but that's a great question. Oh, Marie, okay. Uh, so that is an awesome question. The guideline says it's up to the underwriter's discretion whether or not to count that payment against them. So what I would tell you is this, if their debt to income ratio is already really, really high, and we're closer to 10 than one payments, there's a chance that underwriter says, hey, I know it's got nine payments left, but this payment's $1,000, and these clients are already right up at 50% debt to income ratio. That puts them at 60 or 65. I, I as an underwriter, am not going to be comfortable. So it is an underwriter's discretion. Conversely, the client's got a 40% debt ratio, and the payment on that is only $100 or $200, sure, they may be able to take that out. But it is an underwriter's discretion, and it's really going to be case by case, depending on the client. All right, just one other question in here. What if the buyer is using their credit card and did not tell the lender? Should the buyer let the lender know that? Um, I wouldn't think so. Just once we pull a credit report, credit report's good for 120 days. So if I pull a credit report and you, you as a buyer go to contract quickly 
and I don't have any other reason to pull your credit again, if you use a little bit on your credit card, that's not the end of the world. What does happen before we close is we don't repull credit. However, we do look for new inquiries. So there's a system where we can go in and just see if you've tried to open up any credit. And that usually happens within seven days before closing. Will our processors will get a, they'll go and run a report. They'll see, oh, looks like uh, we had a bank and a credit union run some credit. Maybe the person was thinking about buying a car. We're going to send a letter or an inquiry to the borrower, like, hey, what are these new inquiries about? But the use of a credit card during a transaction shouldn't be a big deal. Um, and again, providing the use of the credit card didn't create a credit pull, meaning that they went back to the credit card company and said, hey, I only got a limit of two grand. I'm trying to buy a house. I want to furnish it. Can you raise it to 10 grand? Their credit card company is going to pull credit. So that potentially could be something that would impact. But if it's within the credit limit of the credit card, we should be fine. All right, so we covered our do's and don'ts cruising through here. A couple other steps that are going to happen. Underwriting and appraisal, that'll happen once you guys clear the home inspection. We're going to do our due diligence. We're going to get it through underwriting. Our object is to get you to clear to close. One important thing about underwriting, just because we say you're approved, that's not, it's not over. Like I've, I've had a client, we told them they were approved and they went out and started spending money. You're really not done on our end until you get the magic letters CTC, clear to close. Again, doesn't mean you can go out and spend money because we probably need some of that money at closing. But once you're clear to close, most of our due diligence is complete. Notice I said most. We're still gonna verify your employment right before you close. And we're still going to check the credit to make sure there's no new inquiries. But for the most part, you're clear to close. Closing. Yeah, that's a celebration day. So closings right now are happening, happening typically in attorney's office or title companies. Since the pandemic, there's been a, when the pandemic started, the only people that can go were you and your attorney. And there would be a title closer there. Now it's kind of opened up, You're starting to see some realtors come back in. It's really case by case in the title company. You're gonna to go to the title company and you're gonna sign your docs and get your keys as a buyer. One really, really, really important point I wanna take, take on here. If you have to wire funds to the title company, some title companies for smaller checks will let you bring certified funds. If you have to have wire funds, do not trust anybody that you get an email from, always verify the wire instructions with your attorney. Your attorney should be the only person that's giving you that information. Verify, even if you see an email from your attorney, verify with the attorney that these are the correct instructions. Really, really critical. There's a lot of wire fraud that go out there. I just helped my brother and sister-in-law get into a place. Somebody from God knows where in the world intercepted an email that came from the title company that had the wire instructions. They put their own wiring instructions and sent them to them. My sister is a smart cook. My sister-in-law is a smart cookie. She caught it and they didn't send money where it didn't have to go. Always, always, always verify the wire instruction with your attorney. Really critical. All right. Home inspection versus appraisal. Good deal. We've already talked about this. Uh, closing cost breakdown. We've kind of talked about this. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because A, we're at our hour where I wanted to be. If there's any questions on this, I'm going to leave this up here for a, a second. We talked about appraisal. We talked about that. We will talk about prepaids because we didn't cover that. In most cases, you're going to have taxes and insurance included in the mortgage payment. You really have to do that unless you're putting 20% down, then you have the right to pay your own taxes and insurance. Otherwise, they're going to be included in there. It's kind of covered in what they call prepaids. Um, it's money that we're going to put aside to pay your taxes and your insurance in the future. Now, we're going to get a, in the state of Illinois, the real estate taxes or property taxes are paid late. So we're going to get a credit from the seller because really we're going to pay their taxes. But it's okay because we're going to get the money at closing. So we don't really spend a lot of time about taxes and insurance that are due at closing, because for the most part, it's going to be taken care of by the seller. 
Uh, so we'll skip there. All right. So I'm going to open this up to questions. We've had Marie had a bunch of really good questions. So I thank you. Thank you very much. I love when it's interactive. It tells me, A, you guys are paying attention and B, that, you know, you've got some things that you want to get answered. So that's what we're here for. Again, this is all about you guys. Any questions you have, please fire them off. Now, I do have a special thing that I wanted to do in here. And last time we ran out of time. And so I believe we're a little over, but I want to cover this last screen. Wealth accumulation. This is something that we'll be teaching to our clients uh, moving forward. And it's this little wealth accumulation formula is something that they teach all around the country. I shouldn't say they. There's about 500 of us that are with a group that makes sure that we're very invested in helping our clients. One way to help the clients is make sure that they're better off financially after they work with us than before they met us. So we're gonna talk about how do you accumulate wealth? Certainly owning your own home is a huge way to accumulate wealth. That, as you make your monthly payments, you're building equity and it's way better than renting. Renting is just so you know, they just came out with the report that rents year over year are up 10.4%. So whoever was renting last year is paying anywhere from 10% or more to pay rent this year. And again, it's just money going out the, out the window. It's crazy. Next thing that we want to talk about, once you get into your home, what's the next two steps you should take? You should certainly have some sort of will. What happens to this property? God forbid something happens to you. If you don't have a will, the state of Illinois will decide what happens to your property. I don't know if you noticed, but they don't make great decisions down in Springfield. You don't want the state of Illinois determining what happens to your property. Get a will once you get the house. The other thing to do is get some term life insurance. For most people, term life insurance is pretty cheap. Um, get some term insurance. You know, we had a situation where a realtor bought a beautiful new house, unfortunately uh, passed away tragically shortly after buying the home, had three children and a spouse, and she wasn't working and no insurance. And that's crazy. So I would always, always advise not only getting insurance, maybe to potentially take care of the mortgage, but to take care of whoever the remaining spouse is so that their lifestyle can still be uh, affordable. Term insurance is really, really cheap. And it's a cheap way to make sure that your family is protected if something happens to you. You know, if 80% of the income comes from one borrower and only 20% the other, that borrower should have more insurance. So, and vice versa. Like my wife carries a fraction of what I carry because I earn more than her. But if something happens to me, she's taken care of. Something happens to her, I have some money to take care of some things, but it's more important she's taken care of. All right, next thing uh, on our wealth accumulator. We showed you that knowing how much your monthly survival number is critical, this three to six months reserves, once you get into the house, you should start putting money away for emergencies. Now, what will determine whether you'd use three or six months is really your ability to get back to work. In other words, in the career that you're in, if you were to lose your job, how easy is it to get back to work? So that if it's really hard and you're in a very finite job where maybe there's not a lot of opportunities here, maybe you're in tech and it's better to be in California or, or Texas to be in tech, whatever it is, if it's longer for you to get back to work, then you want to be closer to the six month side. You should always have three months regardless because maybe it's not necessarily a job loss that created the emergency, maybe it's health but three to six months reserves is critical. Once you have the three to six months reserves, then we go to the next piece, which is how do we save, how do we get save money? Well, certainly one of the first parts is if you have a 401k, most companies match. Even if you don't believe necessarily in the stock market, which is crazy, we'll talk about some examples in a second, but even if you don't believe in the stock market, let's say you think the stock market's overpriced and it's going to be, it's not going up anymore. It's done, which is crazy, but let's say it's done. If your company matches, you're automatically ahead on the match. So if they match dollar for dollar, you're making 
on money that currently would be tax-free. You're not going to get taxed on that money till you take it. If your company has a 401k and they're matching, you should try to take advantage of that as quickly as possible. $20,000 saved a year in a 401k over a 20-year period compounded. I believe the average rate of interest we used for the formula was like 7%. That will be $8 million in 20 years. $20,000, $8 million in 20 years. It's a lot of money. All right. So once you max out your 401k, then you should probably have some individual stocks, um, some individual mutual funds. Why do I recommend that you do individual stock investing? Because it's really important to know a little bit about how to manage your money and know a little bit about stocks. Real quickly, what I'm going to recommend is stocks. Buy stocks and stuff you like. Go to Starbucks every day, buy Starbucks. You got a smiley face box on your doorstep every three days, buy Amazon. That you'll probably have to do through Robinhood because Amazon stocks like $3,000 a share. Robinhood will show you fractional shares. But get a little bit more involved. It's your money. This is how you accumulate wealth. And it's your money that's going to help you down the road. Now, I talk about an S&P index, S&P 500 index fund. Over the last 25 years, the S&P has averaged a rate of return of 9%. You will often hear people say, well, we beat the S&P. Everybody's trying to beat the S&P. Mutual funds don't. 9% is a pretty steady, safe return. It's 9%. So it's pretty good, pretty good place. So learn a little bit about investing, whether you're watching mad money, fast money, learn a little bit about investing when you get to this piece of the pie. Uh, we believe home ownership's the beginning of accumulating wealth. We hope that we helped you here. If you have any other questions, uh, let me know. Uh, how much does Cross Country Mortgage want a buyer to have in reserves? Another great question. Thank you, Marie. Uh, reserves are really going to be determined for the most part by uh, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, even FHA. So we at Cross Country don't have a requirement. We require whatever they require. Um, to be more specific, though, it really depends. And I, I hate that as an answer, but I might have a situation where I have somebody that I'm trying to get approved conventionally. And I'm showing the automated underwriting engine that they have no money left in the bank after the dust settles. They have no reserve, zero. Sometimes if I add two months worth of payments in the bank after they close, I'll get an approval. And so I'll may, I may go to the client and say, by the way, based on what you told me today, I cannot get you approved conventional. Maybe the client wants to buy a condominium, a lot easier to buy a condominium conventionally than it is FHA. So they really want that conventional approval. So we'll let them know, I need to have two months payments in the bank. I might need $3,000 over and above your requirement. Can you get a gift? Can you do some savings? Can you borrow from a 401k? If you get that extra $3,000, I've got that approval for you. So again, that reserve situation, Marie, is case by case. It really just depends on what Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, or FHA. And the same is true with FHA. I've seen FHA not approve somebody with no reserves, but love it when they got a bunch of reserves. Sometimes we'll call a client and say, hey, is there anything else you can give me? And they'll say, well, you know, I got this trust account. I didn't want to bring it up, but I got a hundred grand. We put the hundred thousand in there and it's all of a sudden it's like, hey, we're approved. So um, ultimately is case by case. Any other questions that you guys have? This has been great. So Marie, thank you very much. These have been really good questions, very engaging. Um, so we appreciate that a ton. We will not be doing this program. We're gonna be doing it every month. We won't be doing it the month of December because it's the holidays. We will do it again. Maybe Tony can either shoot me a message or unmute herself because I think we already have a date picked for January. January, our home buyers seminar is going to be on a Saturday. If you're an agent and you want to be involved in this presentation and promote it to your clients, reach out to us. We will do it outside of our standard once a month uh, protocol. And Tony, what do you got for me? I have it's in my notebook. Um, <laughs> I, do, I put you on the spot. Sorry about that. <laughs> you did. It's, um, <laughs> but I had, I'm prepared. Uh, January hey. 19th. Okay. All right. Good. good Which good. is a, right. uh, would be an evening seminar. 
Okay, perfect. Yep. All right, perfect. With that, we're going to get wrapped up here. Thank you guys for attending, and uh, we appreciate you. Let us know if there's anything else we can do. January 19th at, we said that's, uh, oh, it's going to be during the week. Okay, good. All right, excellent. Kept saying Saturday. Thanks for correcting me. I appreciate that. Need the help. So bye, guys.